Radio. Okay, let's get to it. So the announcement came uh, just yesterday. And um, he, he uh, Alan Chiamantin talked about the level of intimidation of varying intensity directly and indirectly unleashed on a significant number of delegates at various voting centers across the 16 regions is unprecedented in the history of the party. This is a statement he made. Uh, and uh, he talked about his polling agent in the Northeast region who suffered severe damage to his eye and, uh, and many other... Uh, acts that he described as despicable unconscionable and appalling okay uh, and then he said he's not willing to participate in this anymore so he's stepping aside this leaves four people uh, in the running to become flag bearer winston let's 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 start with this uh, did did alan uh, quit at the right time well, uh, good morning, Kujo. I mean, you'd, you'd want to ask yourself what would constitute the right time. The party does the balloting today. And so do you wait and go through the balloting and then decide to quit? Uh, he had indicated post the uh, special delegate election that he was going to address the nation on the way forward. If you ask me, I think it's the right time. Um, you know, the party does the balloting today. Um, he's had enough time to think over it. Uh, he's had discussions with his followers. Um, this is the right time to say, look, I don't want to uh, be part of the process. So the party can ballot, uh, the party can move ahead. Look, there's, there's a lot that led to this decision. Uh, in fact, uh, we've captured it in a report. Let's, let's hear this very quickly and then continue the conversation. Rumors of Alan Chamantin's withdrawal from the NPP flag bearership race had filled the air with many dismissing the claim. Political marketing consultant Professor Kobe Mensa is equally surprised by the decision of Alan Chamantin to withdraw from the race. I don't think that quite a number of us, especially those uh, political watchers, had actually anticipated. Uh, this coming. It's a huge indictment to the process. However, spokesperson for the Baumia campaign, Nana Kumia, seemed to have anticipated this move. We believe it's a good step that Honorable Alan Chermantin has taken. Spokesperson for the Alan Chermantin campaign, Yabuabina Samoa, says the decision should be seen as a courageous act. Um, Martin is not going to deny himself uh, to the people of Ghana. He said that he consult, and after consultation, he will come out and define his role. Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, Haruna Mohamed, says the party is yet to be formally informed. We have not officially received any communication from Mr. Alan Koju Chiramantin. So, I mean, look, look, I, I appreciate what Winston says about the timing issue. But mm -hmm. there are those who say, well, well, maybe he could have optimized things by letting the delegates have a go at choosing, you know, one of them as flag bearer. Who knows? It might have been him. Ray? See, the complaints the man has leveled against the entire process are that they are not going to be fair. It wasn't fair previously the kind of intimidation the level playing field required in 2008 at the legon alumni lecture then dr afarijan who was now leaving office as a lecturer commissioner stated 64 standard practices that ensures that there are free and fair elections it includes resources includes the platform for engagement and includes the people who are going to steer the affairs of the process what Alan Chamantin did with the statement is to single out six of the main criteria and say, there is no way I could go into this election with my hands tied behind my back, with a, with a leader already selected by a couple of people and installed and also imposed on the people. It would have been quite strange for him to then proceed to be part of the process and come and complain later on. When indeed, he saw at least there was a prelude that gave him an indication of how it's going to run. Hmm. But people think beyond 
some of these reasons and say they must really evaluated his chances going forward and realized it was not going to be see it was okay losing to Nana Danko Kufado pedigree wise engagements in NPP wise historic worlds and all of that but to lose to Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya if you watch the ladder properly it sounds a bit more humiliating so why don't you curtail that process and look at what options are available to you today before you then go for what appears to be a possible embarrassment in the future so i come and complain about these same things that happen in the mm. super delegates process what he also did which was very damning was that he doesn't even believe that these things will be corrected no matter the structures available in the political party to complain about it and let's not forget Someone like Bacheja could complain about similar problems within the party mm. and in the organization of the elections going forward. Of course, others have said so, but they've not openly come out there to say. The very conversation around Kenya Japan and the things he said during the election, mm. similar complaints, if you listen to those who are actually speaking for him, similar complaints have been raised about mm. how this process has gone. Of course, everybody in the election will have some level of complaint. Depending on how the person is winning or losing. Now, even the person who you purport to be in the lead might even have his or her own complaints of the process and how it's being run. The only problem is, can people see a very fair process in the selection? So that there's no acrimony. So that it doesn't spill over. Because we, see, we saw what happened in 2007 and the eventual results mm. at the end of the day. In fact, some go as far back 1979. And I mentioned the UNC D PFP situation. If party structures, if people feel that we can align properly and take along a block, and whenever the NPP had been divided on the front, it failed and lost the election woefully. Yeah. So, would they have been the best decision to wait and lose miserably? So, they'll come and say that, ah, you saw it coming. You didn't fix the problem. In fact, you realize that it was a flawed system, but still you participated. Mm. And after losing, you're not coming to complain. I think that would have been more problematic. Right. Now, um, uh, Winston... So, it is fair to say that Alan and his team believe that if not for all the influencing and machinations that went on, he would have been the choice. So, if, if that is a fair assumption, then why didn't he come second? Why third? How does he explain Kennedy or Japan beating him? Well... Could you, I mean, I think the point has been made uh, before that uh, this was an election to, uh, you know, shortlist. Uh, this was an election to reduce the number to five and not necessarily an election to uh, determine who places first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. But of course, for anybody who places first, it, it gives you a bit of momentum. I mean, we've had this discussion before, and uh, for instance, one of the things we said, I mean, in the build-up to the uh, national executive election of the NPP. You saw the regional chairman and the regional executive uh, committees, for instance. Met, I mean, a lot of them declaring their support for John Buedu, who lost in the uh, you know election. I, I just made that point to indicate that it's not always the case that okay, when the people at the top support you, you're going to win. That does not also mean that when the people support you at the top, you will not win. So at this stage, it would, I mean, the Alan Chairman team. And many watchers had indicated, we have said this before, that is not to select, so it's not a case of, because I placed third, I am walking away. This is the point, and Raymond has talked about a few things. You, you see, you ask yourself the most important question, is this election going to be fair? Now, part of the reason the Electoral Commission, even the Electoral Commission, okay, uh, gives certain logistics to all candidates contesting presidential elections it's just a way of ensuring that people are able to have a fair election and a free election. And Dr. Aparijan would explain what constitutes free and fair in elections. So I'm not going to go back to that. But I'm making the point that if you look at this particular election, where you've seen people taking sides, where you've seen people indicating this is what we want to do, if you are an Alan Chairman team, you'd have to ask yourself a very simple question. Is it going to be fair? Am I able to compete on all fronts? If I think that this election is not going to be fair, if I think that the system is skewed against me, look, there are people who are going to come and support me in contesting the election. There are people whose funds are going to be used 
in going round. But if the system is working in a way that makes it impossible for me to have a free and fair election, where all, I mean, ch- I mean, everybody has an equal chance, then it will be better for me not to, one, waste the resources of the people who are going to be supporting me. Two, not to risk the lives of those who are going to be my agents, because if the elections were held in 16 centers and one of my agents were attacked, was attacked, if the elections are going to be held in 276 centers, what could happen? I am looking at it and I'm saying, look, they've done their work. And, and, and could you let me, let, me, let me say this, okay? I, I mean, I've seen people say that, oh, because he plays, um, you know, Fed and all of that. But let me just say this. I am aware that after the elections on the 26th, the Alan Chairman team was being, I mean, there were changes going to be made to the team. There were people who had come to join the team. There were even persons who were taking part in the elections who were going to be joining the Alan Chairman team. Okay. So at that point in time, the decision was to contest the election. But of course, when you are done, you would have further consultations. And when you have further consultations, you look at things that are happening. And so, for instance, if your uh, you know, competitors are moving around, if you see that the system is being used to support certain people in getting to the delegates, the system is being used to incentivize certain people to get to the delegates, you have to ask yourself a very simple question. Do I want to continue? Must I be president at all costs? You're putting yourself out for election. And so if you're putting yourself out for elections and you think that the uh, circumstances are making it very difficult, the circumstances are not free and fair, why must you go at all costs? Step down. I mean, I, I not a, it is not anybody's destiny to be president at all costs. Yes. So you step down. And people should be, I mean, the choices that people make should be respected. I mean, if people think that, oh, I am not interested anymore, so be it. Mm. Um, Ray, the, the, or the, the talk before the superdelegates uh, you know, congress was that uh, what, eight of them were planning to rally behind one mm. to go against the establishment candidate, which means eight of them were planning to rally behind Alan to go against Baumia. Now that he's no longer an option, does that break that front? I think what the options were at the time, and you see, in most elections, especially within a political party, you even reach out to your opponents and seek to strike a deal. Sometimes it could be, I would offer your position in my government when we get to electoral yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. Or I want to make him a running mate. Is it possible? Yeah. All those conversations might have happened. But it looked predominantly the case from history and from the engagement that happened that if it was going to be eight of us, and uh, because we all feel that we are the disadvantaged team. We are not the ones with the resources from the state and from the powers that be backing us. So we are more likely to forge a very strong team and prove to the people on the other side that we can still make it work, regardless of who is with the resource of the state. Now, you have asked the question whether it's going to change. Mm. I do not see the other candidates in the election today being the rallying point for the other six or so or seven who are still likely to be very active. Why am I saying so? Historically, they do not have that kind of support going forward. The relationship have not existed in a way that will get them that kind of support. I do not see that eight, no matter how fragmented it is today, equally now coming out to say we are joining the vice president to proceed and win the election mm. they may stay off they may be part of a bigger mpp campaign for 2024 but mm. as to whether or not you can have those alignments happening today and openly declaring support the histories are so suggest that would happen they may be in the background or maybe help in other ways but you do not get that kind of eight against one being formidable today mm. Dr. Oso Free may not be able to get that kind of support. He looks like the alternative uh, option that makes a lot of sense. Of course, there are others too, but he might not be the best of the resources to put your weight behind hmm. because people don't think he will make the kind of impact that you want to see now. And I don't see them all going out there and saying, oh, well, we were prodigal sons, but now we throw our weight solidly behind the vice president hmm. in this particular race because he was the one. 
they were opposing in the first place when they say eight versus one. Okay. I, ho I hope you get the point. Mm. So the establishment theory will not work for them again. Because what appeared to be the most formidable for the against the establishment theory is the one that's also pulling out. Mm. What could they do differently? You think about the possibility that most of these people say, see, no, I mean, to hell with the MPP. Why don't we form our own political party and see? Why don't we branch off into a party or a system that is not carrying the baggage of the current government? Hmm. Now, there's an idea. Uh, Winston, I mean, let me pick your thoughts on that before I ask the other question in my mind. Do you think at this point it is a viable option for Alan to break away, go independent, or start his own party? I mean, I mean, the evidence on the ground doesn't suggest that if you start a, 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 your own party, you're going to make any impact in an election. Um, it is true that today people are unhappy with the system, but um, you, you need to ask yourself very pertinent questions. I mean, you, you're part of the government. And if you're a part of the government and you decide that you want to uh, contest to lead the same party and you're unhappy with uh, you know, some of the challenges that the party goes, I mean, the party uh, you know, failed to resolve, do you go independent? I say no. The Ghanaian system is not like the Nigerian system. And so if our system were like the Nigerian system where you could cross carpet here and there and still make an impact, I'd say, okay, then he can make an impact. Also, because today I do not have evidence of, uh, you know, the number of people that Alan Shamantin can pull away from the NPP. If you ask me, yes, his team had indicated that uh, when it comes to the polling station executives, they had more than 100,000 of them. And so they were convinced that they were going to win the election. But of course, well, would 100,000 votes be significant enough to get you uh, to become president of Ghana? Uh, Dr. Papakwe Sindum had some 120,000 in 2016, and he just pulled 1% of the votes. Okay, so um, let, let me be very honest with you here. The situation of 1979 is different from 2023-2024. I think that um, Alan Tremanting will not form his own party. Mm. It will be suicidal if he decides to do that. The other point is that there's a, there's, a, there's a group that is pushing for an independent presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for those pushing for the independent presidential candidate, will they make overtures, will they you know, extend a hand to Alan Tremanting, for instance? But the other question is, would Ghanaians see Alan Tremanting as the man outside the duopoly mm. to be made president? But also, it is not just enough saying, I want to be president. It is also enough saying that I want to be president who can govern. So in that case, you must be a president who has a significant number of members of parliament. Mm. So you see, the, 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 uh, the um, governance and democratic structure of this country is such that it's going to be very, very difficult to just get up and say, I'm going to run as an independent candidate. If you think, if you want to do that, one, it means that you're seeking just to destroy or hurt the chances of the very party mm. that you belonged to. Mm. Two, one of the things you must realize is that there are people who support you today based on the fact that you are with the NPP. Are those people going to follow you mm. because you have left the NPP? My answer is no. Not all of them will follow you. And we've seen that happening even with um, you know, those who broke away from the NDC, for instance. Mm. The people who had support, okay, they had support because they were in the NDC. But when they broke away from the NDC to form their own party, you saw what they got. Yeah. Let me give you a typical example. Dr. Charles Rekubrobi, um, I'm sure when you were in the university at the time, uh, Kojo, you may have um, realized that the United Ghana Movement, UGM, mm. headed by Dr. Rekubrobi, now he was one of the key elements of the Alliance for Change work, okay? The Kumi Prekun works. Yeah. Dr. Rekubrobi forms his own party and gets 0.3% of the results. Let no one be deceived. Mm. You can choose to stay away. And this is the point.
I'll end on this note before you ask your next question. Mm. Look, your relevance doesn't just end because you decide not to contest an election. This is what could happen. Based on how the NPP's fortunes turn around, in tw- based on their electoral fortunes in 2024, the party could look back and say, ah, we the Alan Koyanka, they are there. Hmm. Based on that. So, why would you want to move away? Stay in the party, campaign for whoever emerges victorious, because, yes, you didn't want to be there because you felt it was skewed uh, in favor of somebody who was against you, but that notwithstanding, you're still a party member. Okay, so here's the question. I think you've led perfectly to the next question I wanted to ask, and I'd love to hear both of you on this, starting with Winston. If Alan Chermantin were to come to you and pay you as a consultant to advise him to answer this one question, yes or no, should he accept if he's offered running mate? Kojo, you know that I have a challenge with answering yes or no. <laughs> yeah, of course, need, I mean. You need to, you need to explain <laughs> the position why it's a yes and why it's a no. <laughs> so, um, Raymond appreciates the fact that before you hypothesize, Raymond, mm-hmm. You yeah. would have led evidence to that conclusion, right? Uh, yeah. Why are you trying to influence Raymond's answer? What is your <laughs> answer? I agree with you. <laughs> it's a basic principle in research. Before you, mm-hmm. you come to any conclusion, you must be led by research. <laughs> and um, um, based on, based on uh, you know, what I know, based on what I have heard, I don't think that Alan Chermantin would accept that. But again, politics is such that you do not have to say a definite yes or no. Discussions can be had. And I have been told of how, you know, certain leading members of the NPP, uh, you know, I, I, I learned over the weekend, you know, were still telling members of the Alan Chairman team, team that, oh, the vice presidential slot is still on the table. You know, you could... You could still pick that up. So uh, if, if you want to consider that. Initially, the discussions about vice president were inconclusive because it was like, I am offering you vice president, come and take it. What the Alan Chairman team, team would have preferred at the time would have been, let's sit down and determine who should get what as president and as vice president. And then we choose who becomes flag bearer and who becomes running mate. Because you get my point. Right. So now that, I mean, it looks like, um, you know, um, Dr. Bamia, if uh, you know, he gets the nod, is going to be the uh, presidential candidate of the NPP. If you're an Alan Sherman team, going into such a discussion, your bargaining power is very low. But... If you're also the NPP and you're looking at this critically, you're asking yourself the very simple question. Who, what qualities do you want in a vice president? Do you want a vice president who's young, who's energetic? Do you want a vice president who cuts across, who's seen as belonging to the central Ashanti and who can also pull uh, votes for you in the voter region? But having said all that I have said, if I were to advise, and I am not going to advise, so I think that based on my learnings, Alan Chemantin would not accept to be running it. Uh, Winston's... Uh, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a yes, right? Well, it, it was a no. He said that he, he doesn't think Alan would accept Okay. Uh, to be running he would not advise him to accept it well he he didn't go that far uh, no uh, Raymond, he, Raymond, i mean it, it's not me going to advise him to accept <laughs> it, but you see, i think that uh-huh. he would not accept it yes uh, so uh, i have answered the question differently uh-huh. i have said that i do not think that well, Alan I, mean, I, 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 I so at this point in time my advice doesn't matter mm, okay no i get you it's very difficult to because see how the political cards play right the factors that will lead to him accepting, it comes to a lot of assurances. Yeah. It comes to a lot of people being part of the conversation. So if today 
it is the lies of the king of Ashanti and uh, and others coming in, you stand a better chance of convincing him than a couple of people whose politics he has doubts. I mean, mm. who really he's not sure that this is a poison chalice that is being handed to me or mm. not coming to him with a proposal. You hope you get the point. Yeah. So it depends on how it's packaged and presented to him. But and what, would that, the, what would that say of his own uh, scruples if after completely condemning the, the activities of this uh, past electoral exercise that mm -hmm. he says favored the vice president, if after condemning all that, he accepts to be his running mate? The reality of politics is that they say he has no saints, but certainly you choose the devil with a uh, very little problem. <laughs> so you look at it this way. He might be concerned about what has happened over the space, but does he want to be irrelevant to the Ghanaian political scheme? See, I have not seen so many Ghanaian politicians who are 100% principled. Mm -hmm. The problem with main politicians is that they give a lot of give and takes. They, the kind of sacrifice they have to make on the job and the kind of things that they have to put their personal integrity off the line and make sure that they actually coerce because of the factors, the people around them, the kind of influence that will come to them. They may be compelled to take up jobs, including this particular position, mm. without he even being willing personally to do so. Because you don't just consider yourself, of course, when mm. they come to say that I'm contesting, they say that people say I should contest. So that people are of the opinion that you should be taking up a role like that. Mm. You might not like it, and I'm saying that there are a few politicians I know who personally say that, listen, my personal principle is that I will not take it, I will never take it. Mm. That's what makes it murky. But when you look at the facts in support of going into this role, will that promote his ultimate ambition? And in any case, is this an ambition that is unchecked? That no matter what, I have to be president. So I accept every single demonic role that will take me closer to it. I hope you are getting my point. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the valuation of these factors. That is why we not the difficulty mm. saying right from the beginning that he would or would not accept it. Because those factors play out differently. If he's, for example, promised that, listen, it is only an election I'm going into. If I don't win the next election, I will stand aside and let you contest as the flag of the party. Mm. If you were him, would you have said that that's a very good deal, so I will take it up? It's worth considering. Yeah, so mm. you get my point. So yeah. as for those factors for a politician, there are many of them. Mm. And the consultation may spring up surprises that many people would not have accepted. That is why they don't close the door completely. Mm -hmm. That's why they always leave room mm. for maneuverability so that they can still play the roles that they play in there. Because if you don't take care, you might be irrelevant in the political space in one electoral cycle. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ray, uh, Winston, you had something to, to wrap yeah, up with. See, uh, I, I mean, I, the, the, the point that Raymond makes, uh, and, you know, he makes the hypothetical, uh, you know, situation. It won't happen. You know, <laughs> you just wanted to say that the hypothetical situation will not happen. Okay. <laughs> no, no, nobody's going to. I mean, no, no, nobody's going to say, if I, if, I, if I contest one term and I don't win, I am going to let you come. Because when you see, when you're very close to power, you want yeah. to give it your all. And so the point really, the point really would have been, you know, um, before this election, where you are deciding. And, and, and look, let me just be blunt here. This is how you have those kind of conversations, because it's been had between the NPP and the PCP in 1996. You decide. And let me say this. At the time, there are people within the NPP who wanted J.A. Kufo to become the vice presidential candidate to Konken Zenaka. Mm. Because Konken Zenaka at the time was the vice president of the republic. Yeah. But when they went into the discussion, this is how you go about it. When you go into the discussion, um, politics is about, uh, you know, some people say it's about the presenting of, uh, you know, alternatives for people to make a choice. Others say, is who gets what, when. Okay? Yeah. So this is the point. Mm. When you go into that discussion, by the time they went into the discussion, they decided on who gets what positions, who uh, gets it, who becomes in charge of what portfolios. Somebody says, I will be vice president. Hmm. Because then you know the vice president is going to be very powerful. But this time, if you're going in already, knowing that somebody is in line to become presidential candidate, your bargaining power is low. And when your bargaining power is low, 
a lot of things thrown at you is what you would accept. If you're an Alan Sherman, are you going to go into this discussion with a low bargaining power? Um, I know that um, Otun Four Worlds has a lot of influence, but I also do know that um, uh, the wise king, King Solomon, sometimes would also appreciate mm. what is happening and will give his advice accordingly. I don't see that happening. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, we've looked into the crystal ball. Uh, looks like no matter what, 2024 is going to be interesting. Mm. Interesting. However, this thing turns out. So uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled uh, uh, as your election headquarters. We'll make sure you don't miss a thing as it unfolds. Uh, thank you both for the analysis. Uh, Winston joining us from uh, an undisclosed location where he's uh, busily debunking hypotheses. And Raymond uh, Aqua in the studio. Thank you both very much.